This unit is on tire models. We must understand tires in order to understand the relationship between forces applied on the wheels of a vehicle and the slip that's happening at the wheels. Let me motivate this by showing you this little video here. So I, I hope it's evident from this video that this vehicle here is clearly not following the kinematic bicycle model. So the kinematic bicycle model is not enough. Which assumption of the kinematic bicycle model is violated in this case? Well, clearly the wheels are slipping. There is a slip angle at each wheel. And because we didn't assume we assumed no slip for the kinematic bicycle model. The kinematic bicycle model is strongly violated here. Of course, this is an extreme case, but in reality, wheels are always sliding a little bit. We are never, um, they are never pu uh, following uh, perfectly the kinematic bicycle model. And so uh, this, of course, depends on, on the terrain. This depends on the type of ground, if it's ice or if it's uh, grass or if it's asphalt. Um, but there's always some slip and so we need to go beyond the kinematic bicycle model that we learned about so far. In order to go beyond and in order to understand what slip is and the relationship between slip and forces, we need to understand tires better. Here's an example of a tire um, that is made of rubber with uh, pressurized air inside and that's based on the air pressure and the uh, weight of the vehicle in touch with the ground on a so-called um, contact patch on this area here that is defining the contact between the wheel and the ground and then what we can do now is we can apply some force to the axle of this wheel, which means that the wheel starts moving forward. But what happens is that because there is no perfect contact of the wheel with the ground, because there's always a little bit of slide, the wheel rotation will not be exactly, this, the wheel rotation speed will not be exactly this, uh, equivalent to the speed the vehicle is moving forward and the discrepancy between these two is called slip. So we're going to use tire models to describe the lateral and longitudinal forces applied at the tires. And there exist many tire models at various levels of complexity going down to the, to the molecule level. But um, we are going to use a very simple qualitative description here. Um, which is called the tread block model and that illustrates the basic phenomenon, the basic, uh, the major, the qualitative behavior of the curves, of the force curves quite well, I think. The question we are trying to answer here is why do tires slip and how exactly do they slip and how does this relate to the force applied at the tires? So we're going to consider the tread block model. Why is it called tread block model? It's called like that because we're considering a tire at the macroscopic level that's composed of many little tread blocks here. You can see here. Each of these is a little piece of rubber basically that's attached to the tire. So you can see only the bottom part of the tire here. And in this case, you can see five of these tread blocks. And you can see already from this figure that the tread blocks don't look the same, but only this tread block here is in its canonical position, in its canonical shape. But these ones here are uh, deformed versions of this one. Now, why are they deforming? Well, as soon as the wheel is driven externally, as soon as we apply a force, a circumferential force to that wheel, these tread blocks start deforming. 
and slipping. So we apply a force to that wheel. Think of applying a force here, starting from a static uh, vehicle, a wheel that has velocity zero. And what that means is that in order to move the vehicle forward, because the vehicle has a mass, we need to apply a force um, relative to the ground. And so this force must be transported through these tread blocks. And what happens now is that as soon as a tread block enters the contact patch, the area where the tire is in contact with the ground, this force is built up by deforming this tread block. And the more the tread block moves to the back, the larger the force is. So this is indicated here by this diagram. The more I'm moving um, along this contact area, the tread block gets deformed. And then once the tread block leaves that contact area, it snaps back into its original position. So it, it looks like this again after it has left the contact area here, basically. And this is already the reason for slip. Um, you can see that these tread blocks deform in order to transport the mass, uh, the, the force, um, in order to apply the force to the ground. Uh, and so the speed of that wheel at uh, um, in this area here is not the same as it would be if um, it would be in perfect contact with the ground because this force is transported through these tread blocks and they are deforming. So you have basically a slip through this phenomenon. The tire tread blocks adhere to the ground, they deform and slip um, when losing contact. So there is this slip happening because they deform and then they slip and so the speed of the wheel and the ground are not the same. Now this is called static friction. Why is it called static friction? Because the tread blocks, while they deform, they're always in contact with the ground. They're not sliding on the ground. However, when the driving force of the wheel increases and the static friction is exceeded, there's a maximum to that friction and that depends on the molecular properties of the material the tire is made of and the material of the ground, if it's asphalt or ice, etc. Um, so as soon as this maximal force, um, the static friction is exceeded, we are moving into the sliding friction area where these tread blocks are start to slip earlier. They don't slip at the very end when they snatch back into their original position, but they are all losing already contact with the ground here maybe because that force is too strong. And that's what we call sliding friction. And so that means that in the first part of this diagram, the uh, tread blocks are still in touch with the ground. So we have the same behavior as here, but then at this point, they are um, starting to slide. And as the sliding friction is smaller than the static friction, this decreases the transmitting driving force. So that's what we want to avoid, basically. If the tire tread blocks start sliding at the very beginning, for example, if you start at a red light and you apply too much force onto the wheel, you will not be able to move um, quickly because you're immediately in the sliding friction area. Or the same happens if you brake your vehicle um, very abruptly at high speed, then you're also in the sliding friction area. So in that case, if the tread, tire tread block starts sliding at the beginning, only the sliding friction can be applied. And the sliding friction is uh, lower than the uh, static friction. So that's something you want to avoid. And that's also what modern uh, braking systems such as the uh, anti-lock brake system ABS is doing. They are starting to, as soon as they realize there is too much slip, they're starting to release the brake from the wheel in order to be able to 
still maneuver the vehicle. And we come to that, why we can't maneuver the vehicle otherwise. But in general, we want to avoid sliding friction also because it's just lower than static friction. So if we wouldn't have ABS, we couldn't brake as strongly. <laughs> we couldn't come to a halt as quickly as we could with such a system. Okay, so this is another curve that plots the force um, that uh, can be applied on the vehicle with respect to the slippage S. Where the slippage is the difference between the surface speed of the wheel and the vehicle speed. Um, and it's a relative um, number. So what this means is that if the, the, the wheel would be in perfect contact with the ground and there would be no slip, this slip slippage S would be zero because then the surface speed of the wheel and the vehicle speed would be identical. Um, and that happens, for example, when you're driving at a constant velocity and you're not accelerating or decelerating and there's no forces applied on the vehicle. Like let's say you drive at slow speeds um, where there is um, no, no other forces acting on, on the vehicle and you don't act on on the axle, you don't apply any force. Now what we can see in this diagram, so this is what this curve looks like. What we can see here also is that the force F grows linearly in the beginning with the slippage S. And this is the area where these tire dread blocks are deforming but still in touch with the ground. But then at some point when we reach static friction, um, when the slippage gets too large, um, this leads to a reduction of F. So we are in the sliding friction um, part of this plot. And the sliding friction again is smaller than the static friction, so we always want to avoid that, for example, through systems like ABS. Now how does this curve F of S change for slippery terrain when we have low friction? I'll give you a second to think about this question. What do you think? How would it change? Well, the start of the curve doesn't change. It doesn't change as the elasticity of the blocks doesn't change. It's still the same tire that we're looking at, the same rubber material and the treads deform in the same way. However, the maximum force that can be applied is reduced due to the decreased static friction because maybe the, the ground is not asphalt anymore, but it's ice now. And so we can't apply the same maximum force anymore. And so the tread block starts sliding earlier due to a decrease in friction. And this is illustrated by this curve here. So qualitatively, both curves look similar. And in the beginning, both are linear but then um, with the lower friction curve, the maximal force that can be applied is less. And so we start sliding also earlier. Now this was for the longitudinal um, force and the longitudinal slippage, but we can do the same analysis for the lateral force. And actually the diagram here looks um, very similar. So in this case, we look at the force which you call FY, lateral sideways to the, vehicle, uh, to the wheel. And the diagram uh, force with respect to slippage, slippage looks similar. We have a linear part in the beginning and then when we reach the maximal force, we go on to sliding friction, which also we want to avoid, we want to avoid sliding sideways as well. So the lateral force FY is analogous to the longitudinal force, but blocks move laterally now. And the lateral force for small slippage values S and small um, wheel slide angles alpha is given by this expression. FY equals uh, a constant that's called the cornering stiffness times alpha, which is the sliding angle of that wheel, which is just the angle between 
the forward facing direction of the wheel and the actual velocity direction that um, this wheel is moving into. We're not gonna derive this formula here. Um, just take it for granted now that this is the case. And so in approximation, we have Fy um, equals C times alpha, which also makes sense. If you look at this diagram and if alpha would be zero, then you actually are following the kinematic bicycle model. So the there's no slip angle at this wheel and the wheel velocity is in the same direction as the orientation of the wheel. But if alpha is large, then we have a large slip angle and the velocity of the wheel is um, lateral or has a, has a large lateral component. And so we are sliding sideways. There's another interesting phenomenon that is worth talking about, which is the so-called circle of forces. The circle of forces tells us that the lateral force that can be applied on a wheel and the longitudinal force that can be applied on the wheel are not independent because they cannot exceed a maximum friction force F max. So we have this circle and all of the forces that we can apply to that um, wheel lie inside that circle. We can't apply stronger forces. And this means that more longitudinal force implies less lateral force or the maximal acceleration can only be applied for straight driving. Consider, for example, you want to make uh, a full stop starting at a velocity of 50 kilometers per hour and you're hitting the brake really hard. Um, so you're you start sliding in the longitudinal direction. What this means is you now can't steer anymore. The vehicle becomes completely, um, you can't maneuver anymore. You, you can't steer anymore. And so this is bad, of course, right? So what you should do is if you want to avoid an obstacle and you can't actually avoid the obstacle just uh, by braking because you're too fast, you shouldn't brake as much, but you should swerve around that obstacle. You should, what you learn in these um, driving seminars is that you, um, you um, hit the brake hard in the beginning, but then you loosen it again in order to swerve around the object in order to avoid making contact with the object. And of course, this is also the motivation behind the anti-lock braking system. It just avoids you um, going into this sliding uh, phase of the curve. And so you are still able to maneuver your vehicle despite hitting the brake fully. So this doesn't only allow us to make statements about the forces applied to the wheels, but similar statements can be made to the accelerations that can be applied to, it, to the entire vehicle because of course the vehicle is on four wheels and if this applies to all four wheels then you have a similar behavior of the acceleration of the vehicle um, and this is what um, I was just referring to if you want to make a um, to come to a full stop then um, you can't accelerate sideways anymore so um, you always have to trade off these these two similarly if you have a strong side wind um, um, but you have already exceeded the acceleration in x direction, in longitudinal direction, then you will be more strongly affected by that side wind compared to if you are not accelerating. 